Good afternoon, everyone. My name's Carl Roper. I'm the uh, TUC National Organiser, and uh, thanks for tuning in, or whatever it is when you do it over the internet, uh, for this webinar uh, called Can't Join, Won't Join, uh, Lessons for uh, Organising Young Workers from the TUC's uh, Organising Project. As I say, I'm the TUC National Organiser. I uh, lead the TUC's work on uh, organising uh, and recruitment. Uh, so what we're going to cover today um, we're going to discuss the problem that faces the trade union movement in terms of organising young workers. We're going to discuss what the TUC's um, Young Workers Project uh, has told us about young people, work and unions. We're going to discuss what this means for unions and particularly our existing approaches and strategies for organising young workers. Uh, and then we're going to discuss what we can and what should we do now. Um, don't forget, um, during the uh, webinar, as well as listening to me attentively, I hope, there are three ways uh, that you can participate. Uh, there's a crowdcast at the bottom uh, of the screen where you can uh, ask questions and take part in uh, polls. And over on the right, you can uh, chat uh, with uh, other participants and say something nice or at the very least constructive, uh, particularly about me. Okay, so uh, before I move on to getting into what's the problem, just a very, very quick recap on the TUC Young Workers Project. It's been a project that's been running for nearly two years now uh, in two very distinct phases. The first one was, was possibly the most comprehensive uh, piece of research into uh, the experiences of young people at work and their attitudes to problems at work, their expectations of work, and particularly what they know and understand about uh, trade unions. We used all of that research to move into the second phase, and that was to create uh, a product that we think might capture the attention of young workers, engage them, give us a chance to uh, find out more information about them um, and introduce uh, trade unions to them. And that has now been launched into a pilot. It's called WorkSmart. It's a job progression officer offer that's online uh, and on a phone app, and we're piloting that uh, product. Um, at the moment. But as I say, um, this uh, webinar is not about that project. My colleague, Claire Coatman, who was due to be with me here today, but has had to give her apologies because she's actually attending meetings about the future of the project and about organising uh, young workers, has already done a webinar, uh, I think, twice about this, the project. So we're going to discuss particularly um, the issues that we face. So what's the problem? First of all, let's recap or remind ourselves of the, st the state of the trade union movements in terms of union membership and density. I'll go through these uh, very quickly. So uh, I think since I did my last webinar on the trade union membership statistics, we've had another uh, set of stats out um, in the summer. Uh, that told us we've got uh, three and a half million members in the public sector, uh, 2.6 million members in the private sector. Um, this slide tells you about union density. That's the proportion of workers who are members of uh, trade unions. As you can see, um, just 23% uh, of the total workforce are members of a union. Um, that's the lowest level, incidentally, since um, these records began. 51% um, in the private sector. And whilst that's a lot better than the national figure, if you look back to 1997, we were over 60%. So we've lost quite a lot of members uh, in the um, public sector and the private sector. We have just 13% of workers who carry a union card. And don't forget um, that that's where, obviously, where the majority of uh, people work. Just, just a, a couple of other uh, figures for you to dwell on while you're looking at this slide. Um, density in the public sector has fallen around 10% since uh, 1995. Now, I think this is the genuinely scary uh, slide, and it's the one that illust illustrates, I suppose, the scale of the challenge that we face as a movement. And the simple statistic is this, is that there are 17 and a half million non-members in the private sector. And if we're going to survive as a movement or retain our effectiveness, we have got to think of ways that we can make a serious dent in that figure. You can also see from that slide that the number of non-members in the public sector, a sector where I freely admit 
it's not always rosy, but by and large, we have co better collective bargaining agreements. We have better recognition agreements. We have a better uh, spread of reps and facility time. We've had 3 million non-members consistently in the public sector um, since 1997, and that represents half of our total membership at the moment. So some work to do even in the uh, public sector. So uh, now onto a couple of slides that illustrate the issue of the problem of organising young workers. So if we look at union density uh, by age, just 7.8% of workers aged 16 to 24 are members, in the, uh, members of a union, as you can see. Over 30% um, of workers aged 15 and over are members of a union. Now, it used to be said, or people used to assume, that the reason that graph looks like that is that workers tend to join unions as they get older. And it's true to a degree that workers tend to join unions as they get a little bit older, but not they don't wait till their mid or late 30s or even their 40s or the 50s. In fact, um, some research we commissioned a, a short while back with the National Institute of Economic and Social Research told us that really the optimum age for someone joining a union is between their late 20s up to about 30 which means that if people haven't joined the union by then, it's highly unlikely they will. And the problem problem we've got is we are just not getting enough people joining in that time frame or getting them ready to join by joining, um, get, getting them in membership very early on in their working lives. And we're going to lose um, a lot of members. Union membership amongst young workers is falling in almost every sector, apart from uh, retail, where it's remained relatively uh, flat. And just a couple of things to point out from this slide. Uh, membership rates for young people in public administration and in uh, education there, the bars um, towards the bottom of the graph, were around 50% in the early 2000s. And they've now fallen to 35% and 45% uh, respectively. So the majority of young people like the majority of the working population, work in the private sector. And here's a, just a little pie chart that gives you a very sort of sharp illustration of the number of young union members working in the private sector. And if I went to a restaurant and asked for a slice of cake, and that was the size of the cake that I was given, I wouldn't be very happy. Um, and neither of them are very happy that such a small proportion of uh, young workers in the private sector are members of a union. Let's just have a look at some of the detail behind that. And this is where young people work. So if we look in the top line, wholesale and retail, 873,000 young workers work in that sector. Just 12% of workers in that sector are in a union. Most of them would be in the, uh, the big supermarkets organized by GMB, Usdor, uh, and Unite. But just 6% of young workers in that sector are members of unions. In the sector that's called accommodation and food services, so that'd be hotels and restaurants, um, over half a million, 598,000 young people um, work in that sector. But just 3% of all workers um, in that sector of any age are members of a union. And amongst young workers, it's actually less than 1%, just not to depress us all, I actually rounded that figure uh, up. In the private sector as a whole, there are just 3.2, there are 3.2 million young people working in the private sector. Density, as we've seen in one of the earlier slides in that sector is 13%. And as we saw in the previous slide, just 5% of all young workers in the private sector are members of a union. So that's the scale of the challenge in terms of young workers uh, work overwhelmingly in sectors of the economy, in the private sector, and in parts of the private sector where there are, there are particularly low levels of union uh, membership. So in one of the previous slides, we looked at union density amongst um, younger workers. This next slide looks at union members. So this is a breakdown of union members by age. And the two things I would point out here is that if you look at the 16 to 24 column, less than one in 20, less than 5% are 
of workers aged 16 to 24 and members uh, um, of our current members are aged 16 to 24, less than one in 20. Yet nearly 40% of our current members are aged over 50. So the simple sort of summary from that slide is that over the next 10 to 15 years, we're going to lose 40% of our current membership. And remember, membership is already at an historically low level. So if we're going to replace those members who are going to be leaving as a result of retirement, we need to start dramatically increasing the number of workers aged 16 to 24 and even 25 to 34 um, into unions. And as you can see, our membership, um, union membership amongst those age groups lags behind um, their proportions in the workforce. So 14% of the total workforce are aged 16 to 24, but just 44.7% of um, union members are in that age group, whereas just 28% of the workforce is currently aged 50 and over, but nearly 40% um, of our members are uh, in that age group. So that's a real demographic time bomb uh, sitting underneath this movement. So just to summarise the problem, uh, as we've seen, less than one in 10 workers aged 16 to 24 are members of a union. Less than one in 20 current members are in that age group. We're going to lose 40% of our existing members through retirement over the next 10 to 15 years. And high numbers of, of young people work in industries and sectors where union membership, density and even presence is particularly low. So now just to look at what the TUT Young Workers Project has told us, and, and these findings came essentially from the um, that quite intensive and I think probably most comprehensive piece of research into young workers and work and attitudes to work in unions um, that probably there's ever been in the trade union movement. So the top line finding is that there are four barriers to collective organisation, four things kind of psychological barriers in a way that make it less easy for unions or difficult for unions to organise young workers. The first is, I think Claire probably covered these when she did her webinar, was that young workers have low expectations of work. They almost expect work to come with a load of problems. As such, because they're already priced in or factored in when they start work, they don't consider them problems that really they should be doing anything about. If anything, they consider themselves fortunate to have a job in the first place. And it's common for them to say, and lots of people in our research said, well, I have to be at work uh, half an hour early. It's unpaid just to get a briefing or a debriefing. But overall, I'm treated fairly. Now, you know, lots of union reps watching this will identify that for someone on the minimum wage, that's actually probably a minimum wage violation is that someone is in for longer than they're getting paid, and that would probably take their pay uh, below the national minimum wage if it was averaged out over the hours they're on duty. But young people have no, no sense of that. The second one was when I read the research, the one I kind of found probably most surprising, but also a little bit kind of saddening, was that there is a lack of trust between young workers, particularly those who work in precarious working, zero-hours contract jobs, uh, etc., it was common amongst the people we researched to hear them say, I could never talk to a colleague about a shared issue. They'd be straight behind my back to the boss and then I'd be in trouble. Now, you know, my belief is that's probably a deliberate tactic by employees in the way that they construct work and they organise work. Um, but it's sad and it's difficult for us if we're trying to create some kind of collective um, sense amongst a particular group of workers. And the last of these first three barriers was a sense of futility, that a sense that even if things needed to change, it would be very difficult, if not impossible, uh, to change things. It was common to hear, why should I put my neck on the line to change something? It's not going to get better anyway. So that idea of putting your head above the parapet to take on an issue that you really didn't think you had any kind of power or ability to change was something that was a, a bit of a, a turn off uh, for lots of young people. And the final uh, barrier 
was there is just generally a complete, genuine ignorance about what unions are. In fact, this was the main reason why unions have a problem in organising young workers. Those barriers to collective organisation are psychological. This one is they just don't know anything about unions. They don't know who we are. They don't know um, what we do. And I think sometimes, I mean, I've, I, um, I've been a trade union uh, member and an activist since I was 17, and that's over 30 years. Um, I've spent most of that time either being an activist in unions, uh, being a union officer, and working for the TUC. And I, like many of the people who are probably watching this work webinar, spend a lot of time in union world. And I struggle sometimes to understand how anybody doesn't know what the TUC is or who Unite are or who Unison or USDOR or the RMT are. But it is true that lots of young people, if you ask them, couldn't name a union, certainly couldn't name a union general secretary. And actually, even worse than that, actually struggle to articulate what unions do, what issues they take on and how they actually help workers. And that issue about them not knowing who we are, as I say, is quite difficult for us to um, get our heads around as active trade unionists. But So what I did was I, I looked back and I, I came up with a load of other, other organisations. And I don't know whether you've heard of any of these um, organisations. The Radio Society of Great Britain, the National Federation of Young Farmers Clubs, Canoe Scotland, the National Archery Society, the Grand National Archery Society, the Neighbourhood Watch Association, the Br British Exploration Club, the National Association of Choirs, the National Association of Flower Arranging Societies, and the National Beekeepers Association. Well, I'd never heard of any of these organisations. And the fact, for, fact is, and the sad fact for us, is that if I was speaking to a group of 16 to 24-year-olds and wanted to do a slide of organisations they in all likelihood had never heard of, I would have included Unite and Usdor and Unison and the GMB and Prospect and PCS and all of our other great unions and, of course, the TUC. They have no idea who we are. And incidentally, these aren't sort of social clubs. The National Association of Flower Arranging Societies has 75,000 members. The Grand National Archery Society has 31,000 members. And the National Neighbourhood Watch Association has 150,000 neighbourhood watch schemes. Now, they're all numbers that are greater than the two or three smaller unions who are affiliated to the TUC. So these aren't little clubs of people. These are organisations with not insignificant membership. But again, if you like me, I've never heard of them because I'm not into canoeing or exploration or beekeeping or flower arranging. I am into singing, but not well enough to join the National Association uh, of Choirs. So there is that genuine ignorance. And, and this I'm, I don't mean to be glib with this slide, but it's only when you think of things that you haven't heard about that you're actually in the space to appreciate why young people don't know about us. The other issue is, is that where young people do know something about unions, there is another kind of ignorance, but also fear. So the research project told us, well, it's not for my job. There is a sense amongst young workers who might have heard of unions that it's really for professionals. It's for firefighters or train drivers or nurses or doctors because they're the people that they hear about. Uh, it's not for people who work in shops or restaurants or coffee shops or anything um, like that. Um, it's too expensive. That 10, 11, 12, 13 pound a month just seems too expensive, particularly when they don't know what they're going to get for it. They think they might get into trouble. They think it's for people who work in large companies. They don't think unions could help them with their particular issue. Again, they don't think it's worth the risk. And they simply don't know which union um, to join. And it's it's not uncommon to hear people go, well, I went on a TUC website or I went on a particular union website and I just couldn't find out if that union was the right union for me. I think in some cases there is an ignorance there, but it's a genuine ignorance. It's not a cynical uh, ignorance or, or one that's deliberate. So 
what did this does this mean for the way that unions are currently trying to organize young workers well before we embark on what might appear to be a little bit of a critique let's firstly acknowledge that there is lots of stuff going on unions are making an effort to engage with and organize young workers indeed even last week last thursday october the 4th there's a fantastic day of action coordinated strikes up and down the country by workers in mcdonald's tdi fridays weatherspoons all taking on the issues of zero hours contracts and low pay and improved rights discrimination and even union recognition we're trying to take on companies like amazon there's lots of good union organizing campaigns the issue is that these are the exception rather than the rule um, and the other issue is that remember the figure I gave you, 3 million young workers working in the private sector, 17 and a half million workers um, working in the, um, in the private sector in total who are non-members. There is an issue of scale. The, are we actually going to be able to put a dent in them figures to basically outpace the rate of decline? And at the moment, as a movement, no blame to any individual union within the TUC, but as a movement, we are not meeting that challenge of organising to scale. So reflecting on the state of union organisation, reflecting on the numbers, reflecting on where young people work, and of course, reflecting on some of the lessons from the Young Workers Project, there are some questions for our existing um, approaches, and I, and I think there's four or five. The first, first one is... As you've seen, unions are not sufficiently organised where young people work. I gave you that table before that set out levels of union membership and organisation in sectors where there are high numbers of young workers. And simply too many young people go to work every day in a workplace where there is no organised union to join in the first place. And that's the biggest issue. Secondly, Lots of our unions have young workers structures. They might have reserved seats on executives. They might have a, they're likely to have a young workers or a young members committee. I think, and I've both been the national organizer and the lead policy officer uh, for young workers in the TUC. And I think our young workers structures are underutilized in trying to understand young people at work or reaching out to young people at work. They are too focused on sectors where we already have organisation and aren't utilised enough in organising um, sectors where we just don't have any membership at all. And I think we could make better use of, use of them. I think the third lesson is, and this is something that we're all guilty of, is that and too often when we talk to young people about unions, we dwell on the past. We stand in front of them and say, we are the people who invented the weekend. We are the people who invented A, B or C right. But the fact is, we're talking about a world of work that is alien to many of them. Most of them don't have guaranteed hours, let alone weekends. In fact, if, the, if, there are, if they have the weekend, they're not getting paid for it because they're just not being given any work. So we've got to, we've got to talk about uh, unions in a way that seems relevant to them now, the issues and the cares and concerns that they have and are facing now, but also create a vision of trade unionism that works for them in the future. Because our models of organisation are based more on the world of work as it once was, not as it is currently and is likely to be in the future. The fourth uh, issue I think it raises is how we use digital technology. And this is basically tools using the internet and using social media uh, and other tools that will allow us to increase our reach and how and um, how many people we can communicate. We have got to find a way to scale up our organizing. Now, I've spent most of my time at the TUC, both teaching um, people to be organisers and develop organising training based on that classic organising model of that we get human beings to go into workplaces, to speak to workers about issues, identifying collective issues, finding the leadership, recruiting workers and getting recognition. And I still believe in that model. 
The problem we've got is it is very difficult to scale that model up in a way that we start to put a serious dent in that 17 million um, figure of 17 million non-members in the private sector. It is very difficult to scale that up. So we have got to find a way to take advantage of the development in digital technology to, to engage and identify and find data on young workers, communicate with them and give them ways to join the union that is much more consistent with their um, experience of digital technology with their bank or with when they donate money online or even when they communicate with their friends. The digital union experience is much poorer than the experience of dealing with lots of other third sector organisations, let alone um, organisations like banks and travel agents and so on and so forth. I mean, the analogy I often use is that if I was sitting with 10 of you in a room with my mobile phone, I could book a holiday, flights and hotels. I could pay for it. You could all transfer your money to me we could do that in 10 minutes using our phones. Think of some of the basic inter interactions that we have with unions online, and we just don't have the capacity uh, to do that. So digital is not a kind of the latest in phrase or word. It is a genuine opportunity for unions to organize to scale. Where employers are using digital technology like Uber drivers and delivery drivers to take the world of work back to the 19th century. We can use digital to organize to scale and organize the workplace of the 21st century. And the final thing I think we need to do is slay some sacred cows about how we organize young workers. And in my time in this job and going out and speaking about union members, and union membership and organizing, but also talking about how we organize young workers. There are three things that are consistently said to me. And, you know, I'm a polite person. Um, I respect the opinions of other people, but I wanted to use this kind of webinar just to kind of slay two or three of these sacred cows. The first one, little picture of a sacred cow there. I hope that doesn't offend any cow fans. Um, Firstly, it's Thatcher's generation that the current group of young people in work, because of a culture of individualism and, you know, looking after yourself, they are somehow genetically um, ill disposed towards anything to do with collectivism and um, rights at work. That's just clearly not the case young people join lots of organizations they take part in lots of things they are collective to blame to to, to suggest that something entered the gene pool in may 1979 when margaret thatcher was elected that rendered everybody born since uh genetically against unions is is clearly wrong and if there's one thing and there's probably lots of things we can learn from um the last general election and the support that the Labour Party, for example, secure from young people, is that young people can be motivated and can be mobilised if they see a point and a relevance to a particular action. In that case, it was voting for a particular political party. We've got to use some of that to mobilise and motivate people to join unions. I think there are differences between joining a political party and going to vote than there are in joining the union, but there are some takeaways. Secondly, the one I hear quite a lot is, oh, we've got, to, we've, got to, we've got to forget about meetings and put on social events. I think that comes from a place of, um, of that lots of our meetings are very boring. Um, lots of our meetings are very poorly attended. So we think, well, young people aren't coming to meetings because they're, they're boring, which is probably true. But I think the, the way to address that is to make meetings more interesting and more relevant. I don't think anyone, any young person has ever joined a union for a social life. You know, young people from my experience of having a young daughter uh, are perfectly capable of organising their own social events. What we've got to do is put the issues that young people care about um, to the fore, and that's workplace issues, not issues about, you know, nightclubs and somewhere to go for a drink. 
And finally, the biggest sacred cow I'm going to slay today is the often um, repeated just get into schools, which I think every time I've done a talk about this, this is something that comes from the um, from the floor or the people that were listening. So the first thing I want to say is it is it would not be a bad thing if every school student at whatever age, 14, 15, 16, learnt about unions. I am not saying that that would be a bad thing. Hearing about our historic role in shaping the world of work, hearing about what we do now, hearing about the TUC as, well, as a major national institution and some of our unions, the role of unions in fighting for equal pay and other equality issues. Everybody should know about that. We are a, a part of the fabric of this country. But to assume, as I think too many of us do in the trade union movement, that that alone will have an impact and an increase on membership amongst young people, I think is bordering on fantasy. The reason young people aren't in unions is not because they're not getting told about us in school. It's that we are not in workplaces that they start their work and life in. As simple as that. I think we put in too much faith in young people, to be frank, to think that if we tell them something when they're 15 and 16, that they will act on it when they're 17 and 18. In fact, we tell lots of young people things when they're 15 and 16. And because they're young and all power to them for it, they don't always do it. So let's be in the workplaces where young people are or where the majority of young people are, those hotels and restaurants and bars and takeaways and shops when they start work and then when we tell them about unions in schools we might be able to join the two together one of the key things we learned during the project was just getting people on a journey to union membership getting them over the genuine ignorance getting them over the fear was one of the most uh, achievable things that we can do and really kind of like you've got to see this you've got to break this down into individual steps We've got to grab the attention of young people on, on an issue that they care about. We've got to give them something that they want. It may always not be what we assume that they want. Indeed, when we were developing the Young Workers Project, the WorkSmart job progression tool came out of what we were told by young people. They wanted help with their career progression. It wasn't what lots of us thought they would want. We thought they would help want help on rights or finding out how much uh, if they were being paid the right amount of money thirdly once we've grabbed their attention we've given something that we want we want to build some affinity we want them to value the developing relationship they have with the trade union movement we want to use that affinity and that trust to find out about issues that they care and are concerned about and as a result of that give them roots into participation, roots into activism that makes their union membership real and live. And then ultimately ask them to join a union. Now, if you compare that process with what goes on in lots of unions and lots of workplaces where young people have sat in front of us, we give them almost a historical a history lesson and we slap them with a union membership form. This is a much different, much more strategic I think much more respectful approach considering what, with what we've learned about young workers. We've got to identify, as we would with any group of workers, what are the action barriers and respond to them by creating action catalysts, things that will make people act. If we look at these, some of these action barriers, the things that stop people getting active or even joining unions, apathy, fear, inertia, self-doubt and isolation. These can all be included under those three barriers to collective organisation I spoke about here, fear, futility, not trusting anybody. And the job of unions is to turn people who are apathetic into angry people because passive, non-angry people tend not to act. People who are fearful by giving them some hope. People who are gripped by inertia because for whatever reason, give them an opportunity to act. People who don't th think there is a sense of futility, tell them that you can make a difference. And the way that you make a difference is by joining the union. 
And that isolation, that lack of trust amongst colleagues by building um, solidarity. Let's let's take the word solidarity off the banners and put it into uh, practice. So just finally, five things that I think we can do in moving forward, and then we we'll, might have time for any questions uh, that have been posted in the chat. First of all, this requires a whole movement response. As I think I've said before in the webinar, the crisis of um, 17 million non-members in the private sector is not going to be addressed by one individual union. It's got to be TUC. It's got to be uh, movement-wide. It might require unions in sectors that are relatively well-organized, helping out, supporting physically and financially unions trying to organize in low-density uh, sectors. Because remember, the existence of low-density sectors in the economy has an impact on the terms and conditions of employers in high density sectors. We can't have, it's hard to maintain islands of unionization, small islands of unionization in sectors with um, low and declining uh, density. Remember, we've done it before. 20 years ago this year, in 1998, the trade union movement responded to a de big declines in membership, but also the opportunities of a new government to set up the organising academy. The big turn to organising away from that kind of self-defeating -de partnership um, at the emp of, uh, approach, emp uh, partnership on the employer's terms to say that it is, with it is within our grasp to organise, to put the resources into train a new cohort of professional organisers to take the union message into non-union Britain. We've done it before, we can do it again. Understand and invest in digital technology. There is a big curve, there has been a big development curve in digital technology over the last five to 10 years. Our problem is, is not so much that we're behind the curve, is that as a movement, we are not aware that that curve actually exists. We are severely underskilled in people in unions, in paid and in voluntary positions who understand how to use digital properly and the opportunities it gives us to organize the scale. It is so much more than setting up a Facebook group or a WhatsApp chat. We are, I love the trade union movement. I've been active in it all of my uh, adult life, but we are innately uh, pretty conservative, obviously with a very small um, C uh, movement. Innovation is not something we find easy. We are democratic organizations. We have rules. We are accountable to those rules and to the members who pay their subs and to the people who elect people into positions of influence. But we've got to find space within the movement to innovate, to work outside the constraints of our rules sometimes and have the confidence to try something and not feel as though if it fails, all future innovation will be called off. When I said in that earlier slide that there is lots of good stuff going on, there is. But the trouble is the good practice is not common practice, and we've got to make sure it is. And I'll go back to what I said early on. The measure of our success in, in, in young workers will be organising to a scale that matches the size and the scale of the challenge. Okay, so that's the end of my uh, presentation. Um, I don't know whether we've got any points or, or questions. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we've had a couple of questions. Um, the first, the first is from Simon. Um, he asks, are there any emerging or even proven effective digital platforms that maximise union uh, recruitment? None that I, I'm going to be honest with you, Simon, none that I could tell you about off the top of my head, but my colleague at the TUC, uh, John Wood, who's our digital manager, certainly will be able to tell you. I think I'm going to give out my email address shortly. Uh, it may already be in the chat, but um, I, I'm not going to give you any um, flannel. Um, if there is, um, I know someone who can tell you about it, so we'll get back to you on that one. Um, question from Dan. How do we challenge older members' perceptions of younger members where they may falsely presume that they won't want to get involved 
or even know what a union is when this may not be the case and this then frames how they approach younger workers okay well um i firstly i'd give them my presentation um secondly i would probably challenge their view that um young people won't get involved in fact my experience is if the conditions are right and the issues are right there isn't actually that much problem in getting their young people involved thirdly i'd ask them to reflect on themselves because um you know if if, if, it, if we're talking about formal activity usually one of the reasons that young people can't get involved in formal activity is all the positions are taken up by older people um and and some of our older reps who do brilliant work hold one or two or three formal positions within the union you know and there was i think there was an initiative up in scotland a while back and um, i think it was called stand aside brother where they were asking particularly men who held more than two or three union positions to give one of them up to allow i think it was either a woman or a young woman um to take over i think where they would be right is that young people don't know much about unions and you know i think i would think well what are we doing to actually address that Sending, sending people like me at my age into school to rant and rave about how unions invented the weekend, I don't think that is going to be that productive, to be honest. Okay. Well, we've got off slightly on the questions. Um, oh, we've got one more, I think. Just bear with us. It won't open. No, yes. Um, in professional occupations, I've seen reference to early career workers instead of young workers. Can this be helpful or an avoidance of using the word young? Is there a need to distinguish between old and young when looking to organise groups of workers? That's from John. Um, I think I might ask you to repeat yeah, the question sorry. there. In professional occupations, I've seen reference to early career workers instead of young workers can this be helpful or should we avoid using the word young and then the second question is there a need to distinguish between old and young when looking to organize groups I, I, I think the I think you choose the vocabulary that matches the setting and the and the context in the industry in the sector I think if early career workers appeals to the group of young workers that you're trying to engage then by all means, use it i don't think it matters i think the strategy and the resources and how you execute it are more important than the terminology the questions are coming in thick and fast now um question from simon again how best can union branches be supported to help recruit new young members okay well i'd make sure that everybody in the branch uh, is on goes on an organizing course uh, there's brilliant organising resources on the TUC uh, education uh, website. There's a, actually a, uh, an e-note called uh, Organising at Work, which gives you all the basics you need to do about uh, mapping and organising around issues and getting people involved um, in the union. Um, I think we're going to publish an updated version of Organising at Work uh, very soon. Um, I think as well, you know, I, I earlier on this year I gave a talk to a CWU organising conference and it was a great event. Some absolutely brilliant union activists. Well, they were all brilliant union activists in the room, uh, but they were all my age and a little bit older, most of them. And the appeal I made to them was that you know, as we all um, near the end of our uh, time as being involved in the union, whether as officers or activists. You know, we all have a duty not to reflect on what we've done, but to reflect on what we're leaving behind. We all love the trade union movement. It doesn't matter what union we're in, what our polit politics are within the trade union movement, what factions we belong to. We're all unified by the fact that we love this movement. We think it plays an important role and it's vital that it survives and flourishes. And part of a way to actually live that belief is to think about what we leave behind. I'm a great believer that one of the thing, very practical things we could do was that, and this is just my view, I should stress this is not a TUC policy, is one idea would be anybody who currently holds a union uh, role within the union in, in a branch uh, as a lay activist, and um, once they get to within a year of retirement, might consider giving that role up and finding a younger person to take it on. I think all too often, you know, the 
the person at the retirement day who's leaving is the union rep who's leaving, and that creates a problem for us. Um, Carly has asked, some <clears throat> unions are taking a much more radical approach, e.g. Um, IWGB. They seem to be gaining a lot of members in precarious workplaces. Do we need to learn from this? I think we learn from everyone who has proven and effective strategies for not just organising strikes, but also recruiting members and retaining them members. I don't care whether the union, whether it's the TUC, unions who are affiliated to the TUC, or unions outside of the TUC. If what they're doing is successful, then let's look at it and let's learn from it. But my definition of success is not just organising an action or just organising a strike. It's a strike that wins. It's a, it's a campaign that secures union recognition and it's union recognition that builds the strength of that branch at work. Anybody who does that successfully is worth listening to and learning from. Uh, a question from Michael. How can we best encourage unions to develop better digital tools and apps, which currently tend to be poor, as this will be developed nationally um, and conferences tend to be taken up with debates around rules? Well, that's true. That they are they are um, taken up with debates around rules. Although, actually, if we were debating rules that actually uh, freed the union to be more innovative and improve our capacity to organise more workers to scale, um, then a debate around rules in and of itself isn't a bad thing. I mean, I think we've got to we've got to see digital not as just a debate about whether unions are modernised. It's about how we use digital to organise to scale. We are not going to make a dent in that 17 and a half million non-members in the private sector by organising workplace by workplace. And I say that as somebody who is a big believer in the power of that organising model. It's not about throwing that model out the window. It's about using new technology to uh, and integrate it within that model so that we can organise to scale. Um, if we look at the recent actions in McDonald's, TGI's, Uber, etc., the key motivating factor is a collective grievance, yeah. specifically a deleterious change in conditions. Where does the identifying and developing of grievances fit into the thinking you've presented here today? Well, I think I think I would go back to those barriers to collective organisation. You know. Um, there's that old phrase, organise, educate, agitate. And clearly, if we have got numbers of young people in work who don't realise some of the things that they're experiencing are wrong or potentially illegal, then the first issue is, is that we've got to educate them about it. But we've got to do it in the whole. You can't just tell people that what's something they're experiencing is bad or wrong without giving them a collective voice mechanism for doing something about it. And as we've seen, that even if we do that, there are some psychological barriers around fear and trust and overcoming apathy that we've also got to address. I think if we run campaigns that take all of those factors into account, not separately, but concurrently, then we have a chance of building effective campaigns. We've got time for a couple more. Um... Have you heard of organise.org.uk, a digital platform labelled as a tech startup that allows us to tackle workplace, is workplace issues without joining a union or paying a fee? Yeah. Do you think this platform can undermine the trade union movement or will it just disappear? I think it's, I, I'm aware of organise.org.uk. Um, um, I think on balance, it's, uh, it's something that the trade union movement uh, can learn from in that I, I've looked at the site. It's pretty easy to use. I like the way it's based on issues and it's targeted at workplaces. What I worry about um, uh, about platforms like Organize is that um, where's the sustainability? If if you win on an issue, where's the sustainability? I think the success of the trade union movement, and I say this that you know the trade union movement can be. Um, conservative in, in its approach to change, the way we can be quite glacial. Um, but we are, those those rules and our structures have sustained us over a hundred and odd years um, and enabled us uh, to win, you know, consistently sometime, and survive sometimes in the face of some quite severe attacks from government and, and, and to get through some very difficult times um, in terms of the economy. My 
firm belief, and you may think I would say this, wouldn't I? And of course I would say this, but the, f- the best future for workers is to join unions who can build sustainable structures in those workplaces, get agreements with employers, get collect- recognition and collective bargaining. Winning one-off campaigns is not a bad thing, but there will always be another issue. Unions, when they have recognition with employers, don't just secure agreements, they enforce agreements. That's the advantage of a, of a proper trade union. And um, last question, if we haven't answered everything to the, um, here, we will um, add some written answers to the Q&A uh, tab on Crowdcast, so, so don't worry. Okay, last question. Um, as a teacher, it's always disappointing to see the area of trade unionism losing its importance in the curriculum, despite our best efforts. In addition to, te- um, at, to it being mentioned at teacher training about joining a trade union, the good reasons for being active are never covered. How can we overcome these? Well, I, I'm not au fait with the syllabus um, in terms of how um, teachers who want to include stuff about trade unions would do that. Um, and, you know, as I said earlier on, I think speaking about unions and the role, their role in society um, is an entirely legitimate um, thing to talk to people, you know, school students um, about. But I, I say all that with the health warning I said earlier. Um, we've got to be careful about putting too much emphasis on that uh, because um, I think it seems like an, an easy solution to what is a clearly much more complex problem and appeals more to us in terms of us, our sense of rightness and fairness that our movement should be spoken about, then it really, there's been any demonstrable uh, impact on um, trade union membership amongst young workers. Okay, everybody, uh, thank you very much. Thanks for listening in. And um, we'll look forward to the next um, webinar, whoever that is, by and whatever issue that's on, but I'm sure it'll be coming soon. Thank you.